President Benito Piacenza, Vice President Christine Pino, Treasurer Dures Tagayuna, Secretary General Hector M. Santos Jr., Assistant Secretary General Maria Cristina Ventura, the various PMA governors of the different regions, Rosa, Dr. Rosalina Balot, Dr. Jose Arnel Manalili, Dr. John Hernani Anyakan Jr., Dr. Jose Manuel Vicente Bello, Dr. Rosalina Caraan, Dr. Lester Lloyd Leocadio, Dr. Augusto Abeleda, Dr. Ricardo Isip Jr., Dr. Jacqueline Asentista, Dr. Alejandro Tan, Dr. Japet Fernandez de Leon, Dr. Luz Acosta Barrientos, Dr. Mercedes Agustin, my good friend Dr. Kazan Benigno Baluyot, he's also my classmate, Dr. Manolito Go, Dr. Eliza Chu, Dr. Glenda Oseraos, fellow PMA members, guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Before I begin, let us all dedicate a moment of silence to all the doctors we have lost in the fight against COVID-19. We truly mourn their loss and acknowledge their heroism and bravery. I would like to thank the PMA for the distinct honor of addressing my dearest colleagues during these trying times I come among you as one who has been in the trenches, mentally and physically exhausted, battered and bruised, bowed but never broken. Even as we have struggled in the front lines and watched our comrades fall, we fought on for the survival of our nation. Some would call us heroes, but all the things we have done is what being a doctor is about. All of us have a story to tell from this pandemic. I would like to share a little bit of mine. As an infectious diseases specialist and a molecular biologist, I have been fortunate to have a skill set that is useful to the country for fighting the pandemic. We say among infectious disease doctors that the next pandemic is just around the corner. We have spent our whole lives training for it, but praying it would never come. While COVID-19 is certainly the most serious, we have actually lived through three pandemics in the last 40 years. The HIV pandemic is still ongoing and has already killed 35 million people. The AH1N1 pandemic in 2009 didn't turn out as serious as the current one, but we learned a lot from it. Serendipitously, I have worked on all three pandemics now and have made some contributions to our understanding of our local pandemics. My work in HIV dealt with the emerging field of molecular epidemiology. And so even before most people had heard of SARS-CoV-2 variant, we were already doing whole genome sequencing of HIV variants, we call them subtypes, in our laboratories. Our HIV sequencing work revealed that the switch in subtype of HIV in the Philippines from subtype B to CRFAE was driving a surge in cases and also a surge in drug resistance. Our work in AH1N1 in 2009 did hundreds of sequences of the virus, detecting some of the first instances of oseltamivir resistance in the Philippines and contributing significantly to the genomic repository of influenza. When COVID emerged and there was a call for molecular bio laboratories to help out with testing, ours in NIH was among the first to respond. We dropped everything and we repurposed our BSL-3 lab to become the first COVID-19 testing laboratory outside the Department of Health subnational laboratories. When the first variants of COVID-19 emerged, we were among the first laboratories to sequence and analyze these. And we were one of the few research laboratories with any experience in viral genomic sequencing and deep sequencing. Let's not forget the immense contribution of my good buddy, infectious disease specialist, Dr. Raul Destura, who recruited me into NIH and developed the first Filipino COVID-19 detection kit. The investment of the Filipino people in our research 
from the previous pandemics really paid off on this one. I was drafted into the COVID-19 national response last February 2020. It was still called NCOV, novel coronavirus, and it was still a PHEIC, public health emergency of international concern, and not yet a pandemic. The Department of Health assembled a group of infectious diseases and public health experts as the technical advisory group. Among these were two other infectious disease doctors and PMA members as well, Dr. Anna Ong Lim and Dr. Marisa Alejandria, the current president of PSMID. We were tasked to advise DOH and the IATF on the technical aspects of COVID-19. Our first few meetings were at the DOH compound and most likely had to do with testing proto and most had to do with testing protocols and preparing for further cases of COVID-19 after we had the first three imported Chinese cases in January. We were involved in decisions such as which countries we would ban flights from and how to get more testing capacity. The entire February 2020 did not see any new cases of COVID-19, but there were more and more PUIs, persons under investigation, as well as returning OFWs who were being quarantined. There was cautious optimism, even as the WHO commended the Philippines on containing its first wave of cases. Come March, this optimism was shattered when two new COVID-19 patients were diagnosed. Patient four had a history of travel to Japan, but it was patient five that was the most concerning. Patient number five had no history of travel or exposure to a COVID-19 positive case. It was only because one of our IDS colleagues, Dr. Shishi Ariola, had the conviction to have this patient tested despite negative risk factors that we were able to discover the volcano in our midst. In retrospect, whole genome sequencing revealed that those cases represented a new introduction of COVID-19 most closely related to a circulating Southeast Asian variant B6. For those of us who worked so hard to prevent entry of viruses coming from China, even as we were learning how to properly don and doff, those efforts did pay off. Unfortunately, the virus came in from another country. As more cases started to come in, the tag was increasingly worried that community transmission had been established. In marathon discussions with different government agencies and WHO, we saw that there was only one way to ensure that the most number of people would survive. Having seen China, Italy, and Spain crushed under a wave of infections, we knew something drastic had to be done we were going to recommend a lockdown. March 12, we were invited to Camp Aguinaldo to meet for the first time with the IATF. After the Department of Health presented, there was a spirited discussion on whether we had enough to go by to lock down. After all, we only had 52 cases, and it seemed inconceivable that we were going to pretty much shut down the economy because of a minuscule number of cases. In a push to convince the IATF, I asked to speak. Drawing on my TED training and everything I had learned in years of interacting with media and giving presentations, I made our case. I started with a well-known line, every disaster movie begins with everyone ignoring the scientists. I am a scientist. Please listen to what I have to say. And they listened. The IATF endorsed the TAG's recommendation for presentation to the president in Malacanang that evening. Coincidentally, I was also asked to brief the vice president in Quezon City that afternoon, which I gladly did as part of the whole of government approach. I then proceeded to Malacanang, where there was an intense discussion with the president eventually electing to proceed with the lockdown. We now know that early lockdown saved tens of thousands of lives. Compared to Mexico, which locked down a mere 10 days after us, the decisive shutdown was able to preserve our healthcare system. 
a few days delay would have been catastrophic. The first few days of the lockdown were met with confusion and a lot of people were still roaming the streets. It, as cases of COVID-19 continued to rise, public transport was suspended and that's when the streets of Metro Manila became deserted. Hospitals started reporting more and more cases and more people died. We were all scared. There were shortages of PPE, testing kits, and many of us got sick. Amid the fear and uncertainty, there was also a lot of solidarity. People sent food and PPE to emergency rooms. Transport was arranged for stranded healthcare workers. Businesses did their best to keep their workers employed and shared what they could with the community. Amid all this, I continued my practice. Unfortunately, I was exposed to two cases of COVID-19. Both were among the earliest fatalities. A few days later, I felt a tickle in my throat and I had the worst scare of my life. I had, admitted, I had myself admitted to the hospital and waited seven excruciating days for my swab results. In the meantime, one of my former IDS fellows and now fellow co-faculty at PGH, Dr. Evelyn Rojas, and my classmate, pulmonologist, Dr. Albert Albay, took care of me. It was the longest seven days of my life, during which I continued to attend meetings virtually and fielded queries from patients and colleagues. I spoke with my former professor, Dr. Raul Hara, who was himself battling COVID-19 as he was being wheeled to the ICU. And I tried my best to assure him that everyone was doing the best he could. This was the last time I talked to him before he died. I cried myself to sleep every night and woke up to tears anew at four in the morning, but nevertheless soldiered on. I terribly missed my family and I was scared. Eva brought me a bottle of Lucinavir Ritonavir from the HIV clinic just in case I needed it for COVID. We didn't know whether it worked or not at that time. Albert scrutinized my x-rays. I took my own vitals so that no one else among the staff would be exposed to me and so that precious PPE would not be used up. When I got my negative results back, I elected to go home and isolate for a few more days. My nine-year-old daughter would slip notes under my door, which really lifted my spirit. It was also during this time that I heard Dr. Sally Gachalian, a pediatric infectious disease colleague, and president of the Philippine Pediatric Society had succumbed to COVID-19. Mam Sally was a dear friend and mentor. We had worked together to restore vaccine confidence after the Dengvaksha fiasco, and I could not believe she was gone. As a tribute, we wrote a eulogy in The Lancet, a testament to the impact her own vaccine work had made globally. I continued to work with the IATF and DOH as part of the TAG. There were many controversies, including the issue of mass testing and the use of rapid antibody tests. Despite strong pressure from many sectors, the TAG, DOH, and the PMA stood firm on what constituted appropriate use of rapid antibody tests. We were eventually proven right that this was a waste of resources and that it gave a false sense of security. As we cautiously opened up in June, we continued to have challenges in testing, and that was when the second surge occurred. Little did we know that the first of the variants had entered, had entered. B1, which has the D614G mutation, makes COVID three to nine times more contagious, and in retrospect, drove our June surge coupled with opening up. Once again, our hospitals were nearly overrun and our healthcare workers led by the PMA and HPAC called for a timeout, which was granted by the government. Thankfully, cases began to go down and we were able to open up again. In December of 2020, we were anticipating a big surge due to increased mobility, but fortunately it did not come. It seemed that our people had learned to live with the virus, properly using face masks and face shields, 
and keeping proper distance. This was the time when our positivity rate went below 5%, the WHO ideal for adequate testing in a country. So it isn't really true that we never had true mass testing. We achieved this in December, and we hope to achieve it again as the cases continue to decrease. With the emergence of the alpha variant, also known as the UK variant or B117, on the advice of the technical advisory group, the president banned travel from countries where the variant had been detected. He also directed the IATF to form the Technical Working Group on COVID-19 Variants, which was co-chaired by the Department of Health uh, with Undersecretary Maria Rosario Singberhere as chair and Infectious Disease Specialist and BCHRD Executive Director, Dr. Jaime Montoya as co-chair. Other members included the Technical Advisory Group, RITM Director and Infec Infectious Disease Specialist, Dr. Celia Carlos, Executive Director of the UPNIH, geneticist, uh, geneticist, pediatrician, and my boss, Dr. Eva Maria Cochonca de la Paz, Dr. Cynthia Saloma of the Philippine Genome Center, and epidemiologist, Dr. John Wong of Epimetrics. The Technical Working Group for uh, Variants, along with the Epidemiology Bureau, was able to detect the first instance of the alpha variant locally in early January. Surprisingly, this patient initially tested negative on arrival, but during quarantine, developed symptoms and was subsequently re-swabbed. He also had just returned from Dubai, which was not among the countries that had documented the UK variant. Whole genome sequencing by the Philippine Genome Center had detected the variant in record time, enough to properly trace the contacts of the traveler and prevent further spread to the community even though it eventually becomes impossible to completely catch all cases coming in, the detection bought us time to prepare. PGC subsequently detected beta, or the South African variant, and gamma, or P1, the Brazilian variant. Uh, thankfully, P1 did not uh, spread to the community, but uh, beta is actually pretty widespread now. Along the way, we discovered theta, or P3, which was first described in Central Visayas, which is a variant of interest, not a variant of concern, that has now made its way to other countries, but fortunately seems to be tapering off locally. So this is the variant that we described with the specific uh, mutations. And uh, this was the publication that first described uh, P3. As we continued to open up in March, the various medical groups, including PMA, began to sound the alarm on an increasing number of cases and admissions to the hospital, coupled with the eventual spread of variants. This contributed to the unprecedented surge in MCR, which again necessitated a drastic lockdown to preserve the healthcare system. As horrific as this surge was, it failed in comparison to what was happening in India and served as a warning that the worst may be yet to come if the variants continue to spread. In the meantime, the vaccines had started to arrive, but reminiscent of the Dingvaksha fiasco, vaccines were once again under attack. As doctors, we know that all properly approved vaccines are safe and effective. We know that in an emergency, the best vaccine is the one in your arm. Unfortunately, many unscientific issues were hurled at the vaccine, and the anti-vaxxers came out in full force. Amid all these doubts, I knew all our vaccines were good to go. I very gladly became the second person in the country to receive the COVID-19 vaccine after PGH director, Dr. Gap Ligaski. I have no regrets. Last month, on top of my continued duties with the TAG, the NITAG, the Lab Experts Panel, the PWG for Variants, and as Director of the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology at the NIH, I ended up taking care of the first four cases of Delta, also known as the Indian variant, in the Philippines. One patient, there were among, 
These were among 12 crew members of the MV Athens Bridge. Let me tell you that what I saw really scared me. Of the four I admitted, one had the highest ferritin I ever saw in a COVID-19 patient, 25,000. He's still recovering and is on his 50th hospital day and still can't really walk without oxygen. One patient died. His ferritin went from 1,700 to 9,000 in 24 hours. He ended up on the ventilator, but eventually succumbed to ARDS. The other two recovered, but their ferritins were also in the thousands. We have to prevent the entry of Delta into our community at all costs. Currently, it is already sweeping the United Kingdom, and there are indications that even partially vaccinated individuals are not well protected. I don't think I need to tell this body to make sure that you get your second dose because the PMA has done a good job in rallying its members to get vaccinated. Nearly 90% of A1 healthcare workers now have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. So that's my story. Many parts of it are everyone's story. We have been through a lot and we are stronger. We have come a long way since last year when we, we were all running scared. We have effective treatment for COVID-19. We have kept deaths relatively low. More and more vaccines have been proven to be safe and effective. We have seen success stories like Israel, where cases and deaths started to go down drastically after they were able to fully vaccinate their vulnerable populations. Yes, Delta is scary, but we know how to protect ourselves. The virus is making its last stand, and we need to continue to stand firm as a society. I would like to commend and congratulate the PMA on its unwavering support of our doctors, particularly those tasked with upholding a science-based approach during this pandemic. I would especially like to acknowledge the PMA's role in uniting our profession in the face of so much adversity. We still have our work cut out for all of us, but I leave you with this comforting thought. All pandemics come to an end. We've learned a lot and we will continue to protect and care for the Filipino people. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing everyone in person again very soon.